Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Keto Answers Podcast. I'm Dr. Anthony Gustin, and it's my job to get to the bottom of a ketogenic diet so you have the answers you need to make keto work for you. Today, I have Jimmy Moore on the mic with me. Jimmy was one of the early pioneers in the low-carb movement, has published several books, including one of the first on a ketogenic diet called Keto Clarity, and has released thousands of podcasts himself about low-carb and ketogenic diet. The man is an absolute machine. In this episode, we chat about how Jimmy lost hundreds of pounds in a ketogenic diet and everything he would do differently if he started today. This includes things like food choice, exercises, lab work, and more. Tons of actionable tips in this episode, especially for those looking to lose fat and just getting started with the ketogenic diet. Tons of fun always chatting with Jimmy, and I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Before we get to the episode, I wanted to chat about our sponsor, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto is all about making a ketogenic diet healthy and accessible. Whether you're reading all of our online guides or articles or enjoying Perfect Keto's exogenous ketones or any other keto-friendly products, everything you need to make keto work for you is at perfectketo.com. I know what you're thinking. Hey, aren't you the founder of Perfect Keto? Yep, that's right. And all of my insanely high standards have been put into making each and every product. My background as a functional medicine clinician helps me craft the cleanest and healthiest possible products and the best information about the ketogenic diet. Head on over to perfectketo.com to learn anything you need to know about the ketogenic diet. And if you've never tried any of our products before, feel free to use the code Keto Podcast for 20% off your first order. With that being said, let's get into the show. So yeah, obviously I wanted to have you on the show. You are one of the kind of leaders in the keto space and have been since the beginning. So for the three people out there who just got into keto who have no idea who you are, <laughs> why don't we just start and, and kind of bring it back a little bit and, and mention kind of your whole health journey, which has been pretty incredible. Thank you. Yeah, I grew up a child of the 1980s, which means my mom bought into low fat mania hook, line and sinker. And I remember being a kid, my brother Kevin and little sister Beverly, you know, we'd have like Captain Crunch and Doritos and Coca-Cola and all the what I now call crappy garbage all through our house. Meanwhile, mama would try every low fat diet known to mankind. She had those rice cakes. (laughs) They're disgusting, by the way. Don't eat rice cakes. You might as well have styrofoam. But Kevin and I used to try to put like peanut butter and jelly on it to see if it helped. No, it does not help. It's still gross. In fact, they tried to make flavored ones. It's really bad. But uh, so she'd have those kind of things and fat free ice cream and skim milk and Diet Coke. And I'm just going, there's no meaning of life when you eat that way. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know. But I learned at a very early age, if you want to lose weight, if you want to be healthy, that's what you had to do. And so, and of course I got it reinforced in school again and again and again with the food pyramid, which is now my plate, but back then it was the food guide pyramid. And so we had to memorize it and all those grains you were supposed to eat, blah, blah, blah. And so all through my childhood, this is what I got exposed to uh, as healthy. So every time I wanted to be healthy, which started in high school. And I remember famously in the 11th grade, I went on like a slim fast type of diet. So very low fat, this high, high sugar, high fiber drink. And, and I lost weight, but I just never felt good. I was always hungry and I just didn't do well on it. So needless to say, I gained back the weight after losing it. And so I go off and become an adult and everybody's like, Oh, well, when you turn 18, you get out of the house, you go to college, you should know how to eat. I'm like, really? How does that work? (laughs) You know what you know based on what you learned growing up. And for me, again, it was low fat, you know, eat healthy whole grains and exercise. And that's the way to health. And so I go through all through my 20s, kind of up and down, doing low fat diets here and there. And then, you know, going back to foods that I wanted to eat again. And that's how I got to be where I was in 2003, uh, where I weighed over 400 pounds. And was on a one-way ticket to an early grave. I actually had high cholesterol, was taking a medication for, high blood pressure medication, and wheezing. I was doing some respiratory uh, drug as well with the Advair. I had to suck that into my lungs every day to keep from wheezing. And so it wasn't a good place. And 410 pounds, I needed to do something. But the problem was every time I wanted to do something, it was always predicated on a low-fat high carb, high healthy whole grain diet. And I got a diet book for Christmas that year, Anthony, from my mother-in-law. <laughs> my mother-in-law. Yeah. So my, my mother-in-law, uh, 
Christine's mom, God bless her. T- today I hug her and I thank her so much. But at the time I was like, oh, great. Thanks, mom. I'm, I'm, I know I'm fat. Thanks for the reminder with the book. But, but she gave me a book that year that literally changed my life. And it was Dr. Atkins' New Diet Revolution. I had never heard of cutting your carbs and that being healthy and eating more fat in your diet and that being healthy and this thing called ketosis and that being a good thing for your body. And I truly thought the guy was whacked out of his mind, but every diet I'd ever tried before was a miserable failure. And so January 1st, 2004, I started doing a new year's resolution to lose weight that year. And it ended up being a new life resolution that literally changed every aspect of my life uh, moving forward, including my career and what I'm doing today. It's just, if you'd have told 16 year old Jimmy Moore, this is what I'd be doing for a living at 45, I would have laughed in your face. <laughs> so what were you doing at in 2004 before you made that switch? Um, and like, what was your life? Obviously you said you had all these health problems, but kind of walk us back a little bit and, and let us know like, what was the day to day like then? Yeah, let me give you a little bit of context, too. So my brother, Kevin, uh, was four years older than me. And at the age of 32, uh, his age of 32, I was 28. He had three heart attacks in one week. So it almost killed him at the age of 32. Now, he was morbidly obese as well. Uh, and then later developed type 2 diabetes, which we know uh, is related to the heart disease as well. And so uh, that kind of lit this fire under me that I needed to do something. And I was on this journey. That was in 1999 when that happened. And so I was on this journey to try to find something so that I didn't become Kevin. Um, And I would do the low-fat diets and get so frustrated that, oh, my gosh, there's got to be a better way. And until I found the Atkins diet, I didn't know what that better way was going to be. So 2003, before I started this journey, I mean, it was just fast food. It was going to McDonald's and getting two sausage, egg and cheese biscuits and then going by the 7-Eleven and getting not just a big gulp, not just a super big gulp, but the double gulp. Um, So much high fructose corn syrup. I I shudder to think about how much is that was at this point, um, you know, and, and eating snack cakes and, and just constantly having to feed the beast. And, and here's something, you know, people are like, why eat that way? Well, here's something that a lot of people don't talk about in their journeys, but I will. Um, I was hiding some pain too. You know, I had a lot of pain uh, of different things that happened in my life. And so rather than turning to drugs or alcohol, my drug of choice was food uh, and specifically sugar. Um, and so after a while, that binging of food becomes an addiction and, and, and it was a full on addiction for me that thankfully a low carb Atkins style keto diet brought me out of. So Jan 1, 2004, you got started. What, what did that look like? Did you switch from, like you said, the, the big gulps and all this other stuff straight into a ketogenic style approach and Atkins diet? And how did you face those things? I jumped hook, line, sinker right into it because, and and I'll give you more context because you asked about the day today. I was drinking, no lie, Anthony, 16 cans of Coca-Cola a day. Now you do the math. It's 45 grams per can and 16 of those just in liquid form of calories and carbs and sugar. And then add to that all the crappy garbage food I was eating. It was it was significant. And then January 1st, 2004, I went from probably close to 16 to 1700 grams of carbohydrate a day down to 20. Oh, my goodness. How did that feel? Now, you know how that felt. <laughs> <laughs> that was pure murder pain. I remember that day I was in the parking lot of the of the grocery store because I was going to get, you know, keto friendly foods to put in my pantry and and my refrigerator. And I was sitting in the car listening to the afternoon uh, radio show host on on the talk radio station. And he's like, hey, if you're doing a, a New Year's resolution today, call in and tell us how it's going. Well, at that point, it had been about nine hours since I started the Atkins diet. And I was feeling the withdrawal effects. Remember, I told you I had an addiction to sugar. I didn't realize how bad it was until day one of going Atkins. <laughs> and so 1,600 grams of carbs down to 20, I was feeling it by about 3.30 in the afternoon when I heard him say that. So I call in and first thing out of my mouth was, 
because uh, <laughs> that's literally how I felt. I got home from the grocery store and I plopped on the couch and Christine thought my wife, Christine thought I was dying. She's like, are you okay? I said, no, Atkins. <laughs> but it was, it was pain for that day. And then uh, two or three more days after that, I mean, my body, I, I've never taken drugs in my life, but I can imagine if this is what coming off of crack cocaine feels like, I don't wish that on anybody. It was it was murderous. But the good news is you come out on the other side of that and you have such clear mind, such robust energy, such for the first time in my entire life, satiety and lack of cravings. Now they didn't completely go away. That took some time, a few months for that to happen. But just within that first week, getting over that hump of, oh my gosh, I'm off of the sugar now and I'm okay. I, I'm still living. I'm still breathing. I'm, I'm moaning, but I'm still breathing. And yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty traumatic in the early days, but I tell people, you know, of course, now you've got things like exogenous ketones and you've got, you know, electrolyte supplementation and all kind of things that can make all that transition better. But back then I went cold turkey and I felt every bit of it. Well, even you said you were at the grocery store trying to find keto friendly foods in 2004. Yes. That probably wasn't an easy task. Well, and keep in mind, I didn't have the knowledge that I have now about you know, low carb, uh, keto, I was buying bologna and hot dogs and hamburger meat and cheese and mustard and mayonnaise, all the conventional foods trying to fit this, this context. And I did, you know, very well eating those foods. That's a lesson in and of itself that let's be a little bit patient with people coming from a very bad place. Let them have that just for time. And then at some point, then the education comes in once they see a little bit of success, the education piece comes in and you say, you know what, there's better quality of food that you can choose. But I think if you if you lead with the quality and say, oh, you must have this or you can't do keto, you're going to leave a lot of people out. Interesting. So what was the day that you said, obviously, the, the McDonald's sandwiches and the Big Gulp? And then what type of meals were you having when you switched over to the 20 gram carbs? Just kind oh. of a, a mashup of the things that you were talking about? Yeah. So in the morning, it was so funny. The first day, Christine, God bless her, she was trying to appease me because she was used to seeing like big plates of pasta that I would uh, that I would eat. So she made a whole dozen eggs in a pan cooked in butter for me. And she brought it to me and I went, what am I supposed to do with this? And she's like, <laughs> well, you eat that much pasta. Surely you can eat that much eggs. I ate about a third of it and went, Oh my gosh, I am so full. She's like, what? You know, it, there was no concept of it was a different kind of food than what I was eating before. And that was crappy garbage. But this was fat and protein with very little carbohydrates. And so it, it, it took both of us a little bit of time to kind of wrap our heads around, oh, well, the volume of food is going to go way down because the foods I'm eating now are so satiating. They're so delicious. I don't really want or have to keep feeding that beast, not realizing that when I had the pasta, it was naturally stoking me to have more hunger, those hormones, ghrelin and different ones being stoked that I, I had to keep eating to try to, you know, feed the beast. But once you feed it, you know, foods that it wants like eggs, um, you know, you don't have to eat as much and then you stay satisfied for a lot longer. So uh, I would eat eggs and sausage as a typical breakfast. Um, and then I would bring my own food to to uh, to the work and I would have things like pepperoni and cheese roll ups um, again, very when I first started, it was very remedial. It was very it was obvious I didn't really know a lot about this, but I was finding my way and I eventually found my way really well and now I eat really good. So when you transitioned, you obviously mentioned all the negative withdrawal symptoms. But yes. what were the first few things that you noticed that were kind of a positive adaptation? Was it was it weight of a scale and how quick did that happen? Was it oh yeah? Was it obviously yeah. energy levels, like you said, mental clarity? What, what were the the top things you noticed right away? Immediately the weight loss. Um, I mean, you can't go from 17, 16, 1700 grams of almost all sugar down to 20 and not lose weight. So, <laughs> uh, so went from 410 and dropped 14 pounds in the first week. And of course, you and I both know that was like all that water with the glyc my glycogen dump basically is what happened. Right. But then I lost 30 pounds in that first 30 days. And it was within about week two, three that I noticed I couldn't stop wiggling. 
I was wanting to move. And of course, anybody that knew me then would say, you wanted to what? Uh, Yes, I wanted to go and work out. I wanted to go to the gym. And so uh, we had a free gym membership uh, with my work at the time. So I went down to the YMCA and got on the treadmill at lunchtime in the month of February that year. And I would uh, set the treadmill on three miles an hour, which is very slow. But at the time, uh, when it was still like 380 pounds, that was pretty, pretty intense. And so I'd do three miles an hour for 15 minutes and I'd get off of that thing and I'd be dripping sweat and, you know, huffing and puffing. But I knew I needed to get that energy out of me because I was just suddenly feeling this burst of energy, which I now know is the ketones were kicking in really hard for me. And I was able to use those as a substrate energy source. And, and, it, and I used them very well and was able to get rid of them that way. And then, of course, once you add in exercise with a ketogenic diet, you know, that helps propel weight loss even faster. So month two, February, I lost another 40 pounds that second month. Um, I didn't really notice the brain health stuff, but I wasn't paying attention to that. I was in my young 30s, and so I, I didn't really pay attention to that till I started getting older. And and so I, I don't remember, Anthony, about that, but I do know hunger and craving control pretty quick, the energy and the weight loss were the three biggies that I noticed right away. Sounds amazing. And you did, so 70 pounds in two months? Uh, 70 pounds in two months, a hundred pounds in the first hundred days. And I did have a period of time. This is a great lesson too. I did have a period of time because I was meticulously writing down and weighing myself. Yes. I was one of those people that weighed himself like 10 times a day. Cause I was so into this at the time. <laughs> I don't do that anymore, but at the time I felt like it motivated me to want to do it. It doesn't motivate everybody. Some people, it makes them upset and then the stress keeps them from losing weight. And yeah, you know the story. So, um, yeah, I, I just, I, what was the question one more time? Oh yeah. Just, just the comments on how much weight you lost kind of in the first little bit, it was, it, I mean, it's, it's pretty spectacular and the, the, you kept it up for a, for a while. It's, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. So I lost a hundred pounds, a hundred days and then 10 weeks in a row. See, I need some exogenous ketones to get my brain on fire again. Uh, 10 weeks in a row, I didn't lose a single pound and I was like, okay, but I'm still feeling good. Doesn't mean the diet's failed. I've already lost a hundred pounds. So even if I don't lose for three, four months, hundred pounds already in like a hundred days, that's unheard of. And so I didn't fret about it. I was kind of miffed a little bit. I'm like, come on, you know, you were doing so good. Keep it going. And (laughs) so uh, finally it did start going again after the 10 weeks. But during that 10 weeks, I was taking measurements and I ended up losing six inches more off my waist when no weight on the scale was coming down. And so Uh, it reminded me that this isn't just about that weight on the scale. This is about whole health. This is about fitness. This is about what changes are happening in the body. And I now know and now realize my body was going through a pretty major shift at that point, going from this monstrosity of a man, you know, and, and, you know, reshaping my body into the body I would become. So essentially you hypothesize that you're gaining lean tissue and, and losing fat at the same time, but that I kind have of net, no doubt that net I have gain no doubt was, that's was zero. That. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a lot of times, like you said, you, you started going to the gym and, and doing more things at that point when you hadn't before. So yes. of, of course, a lot of the, the initial weight loss can be just fat from the beginning, but then people get frustrated when they hit plateaus. Right. But this is where I encourage people to do something called the mirror test where I mean, if you look in the mirror and things are changing, like you said, you were taking measurements and yep. you, you have some change. Like it's not always just the, the number on the scale. That's why things like, you know, now body fat testing is so easy to get done. Or like I just said, just, just take some photos and compare them week over week in the mirror. And you'll be surprised a lot of times, um, either even at a higher weight, people will, will look a lot better when they start really getting into some strength training, um, yes. especially females. And, and, you know, they'll see a number on the scale and lose their minds, but then look in the mirror and then like what they see. And so you can't always go on that number, obviously, as you learned. Well, I tell people that I was weightlifting when I started uh, walking on that treadmill because I had a lot of weight I was having to carry at that point. So I kind of was doing some resistance training at that point. And uh, yeah, my legs are killer strong today, man. (laughs) Did did that um, that workout routine kind of parlay from from treadmill and then did you start? Kind of oh my gosh, and, and the elliptical next, and then I would do spin classes, and yeah, I, I got a little bit addicted to, to exercising. Now, here's kind of a funny thing. I was so worried 
about gaining weight that I didn't start lifting weights until long after I lost all the weight that year and, and added it in a couple of years later. But my fear, and of course, remember, I didn't know anything about this stuff at the time. I was fearful that if I started lifting weights, oh my gosh, that would put on pounds. Right. Of course, we now know that's muscle pounds and it would have been great. But that was that was how the mind games were playing with me of, I'm already starting at 400 plus pounds. I don't need to gain weight. And if you lift weights, you're going to gain all this, you know, muscle weight and that's not good. And uh, again, I now know better. So. so that, that first year, that first hundred days or so, were there any kind of sticking points where you thought, Oh my God, I can't keep doing this. I need to go back. I, you know, I had these cravings. Like you said, that took a couple months. Like what were the, what were the downfalls or the hard parts of that, that switch? The hardest part I would have to say is, um, and it's going to be gross on your show, so I'm sorry about that, but the, the toilet stuff, um, I would notice that I would have weird gastro stuff happening. I'm trying to be clean about it, <laughs> <laughs> but I would see all kind of weird stuff and I'm like, okay, it, is that normal? I mean, I now know my gut health was pretty compromised at the right. at the time, duh. <laughs> but back then, nobody was talking gut health stuff, so I didn't know anything about it. Um, but yeah, I, I think my body was probably killing off a lot of that really bad stuff that I had allowed to fester and, and in my stomach. And so, so yeah, a lot of that stuff was coming out and it kind of freaked me out because I had nobody to talk about. Why is it that color? Why is it that consistency? And so that was, I wasn't worried about it as much as I was, what is this kind of thing? It, it just, it was so new to me that I didn't know what to make of it. And of course, I wasn't telling my doctor or anything at the time uh, about what I was doing. I was just doing this. Right. And so did your doctor, did, did you have lab labs before you started? The- oh gosh, I wish. So <laughs> remember 410 pound Jimmy Moore was chugging 16 cans of Coca-Cola and two whole box- boxes of little Debbie snack cakes and fast food. I didn't give a rip Anthony about my health. I, I didn't even know what a triglyceride was. I didn't know what a fasting insulin was. So no, I, I it, now I wish I had, but obviously those numbers had to be you know, probably on the verge of type two diabetes, um, which is why I still deal with insulin resistance probably still today. Um, but no, I didn't have any of those things run. Okay. And you weren't on any medications or anything like that? Well, when I started, remember I I was on the high cholesterol medication. So at that time was Crestor. Uh, and then I was on high blood pressure medication and, um, and, and the Advair for, uh, for respiratory. I came off the Advair within about six weeks. I just stopped wheezing. And I came off the high blood pressure medication after about uh, two months, I believe it was. I was getting off the couch and I'd be getting dizzy. And I'm like, okay, I don't need that anymore. And then I held on to the cholesterol one for the longest time because I still was worried about what this diet was doing to my cholesterol. But I had lost such a significant amount of weight after nine months, well over 100 pounds at that point. I was like, why am I still taking these poison pills? Because I felt horrible taking them. So I got off of them and I've never picked up another prescription drug since. So you obviously wrote a book about this topic, cholesterol clarity, and kind of you, you said you thought in the beginning that this might be doing damage to either heart health or right. triglyceride levels or, or cholesterol. Can you kind of run us through when you realize all this information and, and how you came to the conclusion, obviously, that it's actually the other way around? I still get a lot of questions, obviously, through Perfect Keto about... People wondering if it's, you know, is it just going to raise my LDL cholesterol? Obviously, it's not the only picture and the only thing you have to worry about. It's more nuanced yeah. than that. But kind of where was the realization at for you and what made you want to write that book? You know what it was? It was going back to see my doctor at the end of the Atkins journey in 2004, losing 180 pounds and pretty much changing my life and into the person that I'm famous for today. And so I go to talk to him and, oh, how'd you, how'd you lose so much weight? Oh, I did the Atkins diet oh, we need to check your cholesterol. It wasn't, good job, Jimmy. It wasn't, oh my gosh, you have to be healthier. You know, if I said, you know, if I did the the food pyramid diet, he, oh, great job. You know, it would have been no question about it. But because I said the A word, um, or now the K word in our, in our world today, you know, the doctor had a conniption fit. And so I'm like, run my numbers. I'm got, I got nothing to be afraid of. So I had already started to learn a little bit about what the numbers meant. 
um, still was kind of solidifying that, that in my head, but I got back the numbers and my triglycerides were 43 and my HDL was 72. And the ratio between those two numbers was amazing. But my total cholesterol was like 270 and LDL was like 160, something like that. And so he had a, a, you know, a fit over the LDL and the total cholesterol. But I said, well, what about this triglycerides and this HDL? Isn't that good? Yeah, but we don't really pay attention to those things. LDL and total cholesterol is all that matters. And it was at that point, Anthony, that I said, somebody's got to write a book about this someday. And that was in 2005. And then I did write the book eight years later. <laughs> So what did you learn that obviously eight years, a lot's changed even in the last five years and what we yes. know about that with obviously like fractionated lipid panels and things That's uh, right. that give you a little more clarity, but what were the main things that you learned that people have maybe misconception about on the, you know, the LDL versus HDL and triglycerides and all this stuff? Oh, you are pushing my hot buttons now. So LDL is a big one to me because LDL-C is what I'm referring to. So on your standard lipid panel, when you have cholesterol run, most people don't realize, Anthony, you do because you're in this, but most people don't realize that is a guesstimated uh, number that's calculated based on this equation called the Friedwald equation. And so you run your triglycerides, you run the uh, HDL and all the other numbers through this nice little equation and out pops this LDLC. Well, when you eat a lower carb ketogenic diet, your HDL um, is higher and your triglycerides are lower. So if your HDL is over 50 and your triglycerides are under 100, guess what? That Friedwald equation is going to miscalculate your LDLC. So it's going to make it look like on paper that you're unhealthier because you have this higher LDL, which then contributes to a higher level of total cholesterol. And then that's when they start uh, saying the statin word. And of course, what they don't realize too in that total cholesterol, part of what makes it high is if you have really good HDL cholesterol levels. So for women, that could be well over you know, 75, 80. And for men, generally, if you're around 70, that's pretty good. And yet it accounts for your total cholesterol. It's in that number. So why are we, why are we vilifying the total cholesterol when one of the numbers in that that's high that makes it higher is a good thing. And then one other number in there that is guesstimated and calculated based on an antiquated equation, it's unreliable. And so I, I think everything about that lipid panel is in question of at least the traditional way that we're looking at it. Now, what I was talking about earlier with the triglyceride to HDL ratio, you definitely want that under two and ideally under one to be very healthy. So that 72 HDL that I had right after my weight loss and then 43 triglycerides, that was almost a 0.5 um, triglyceride to HDL ratio, which is spectacular. And of course, there's proxy markers as well, things like your HSCRP to look for actual signs of disease and inflammation that's happening. Uh, there's a CT heart scan that you can have run. Your doctor, at least here in South Carolina, can prescribe it. And I can go down to a lab and they do kind of this CT of your chest and they give you a calcium score. Mine has been zero three times in the past 10 years. Um, zero is good. <laughs> and so you can do all of these things. And then like you mentioned, there are these particle uh, size tests, the NMR lipo profiles that you could actually see the breakdown of that LDL. LDL isn't just one number. It's a multiplicity of numbers. So you've got the large fluffy kind, which are indicative of, uh, of a ketogenic diet that are not harmful to you. And then you've got the small, dense, uh, BB-sized LD LDL particles, and those can easily penetrate the arterial wall and lead to heart attacks and heart disease. And so that's the bad guy. And guess what makes that happen? It's two things. It's carbohydrate and it's vegetable oils. Those two things make the small, dense LDL particles show up like a champ, and you don't want those. Right. So I think something you pointed out is very, very alarming that a lot of people don't realize that, like you said, it's a guesstimate. And especially if numbers change over time, it's, right. it's a relative number that even if it were high, if you don't have a particle number count, it's not right. indicative of if it's a problem or not. And so you get this guesstimate number that isn't even correlated with negative outcomes. And then you right. prescribe medications based upon that. I mean, this is one of the things that obviously bothers me a lot. And I think, I don't know if it was that book or another one where you wrote the story of, um, it was your wife going into the, 
and, and you yep. were challenging the doctor on that kind of the similar stuff as well. And like, that's and, right. And, and you, you guys did your own little end of one experiment, but yeah, I, I mean, these type of things were, were, there's just so much misconception about why we are doing things and what we're looking at. Um, is there anything else kind of as far as a testing standpoint or labs where you look at it and you've seen in a ketogenic diet that it's just misconception and, and it's kind of a myth as far as people getting alarmed about stuff like that? Well, and here's the thing. I mean, think about cholesterol being elevated. Cholesterol doesn't just go up on its own. Cholesterol goes up as a direct result of trying to deal with inflammation. And I often right. tell the story, uh, the analogy about how cholesterol is like the firefighters inside your body and inflammation is the fire. And so if your neighbor's house was on fire, you would want firefighters to come put that fire out, right? So, so you need more firefighters to deal with the fires. Well, when you take a statin drug and you lower the amount of cholesterol in your body, you're basically telling your body, eh, we're going to shut down a bunch of fire stations. And if a fire happens near you and there's no firefighter, guess what? Your, your house is going to burn down. And so that's, that's the analogy that I think really hammers home that it's not about cholesterol being the enemy. The presence of cholesterol means there's some kind of inflammation that's being dealt with. So for me, that included, and I told this in, in Cholesterol Clarity, that I had some dental stuff going on, like really deeply embedded infections where I had root canals way long time ago in my early 20s. And so those things started being infected. I had some mercury amalgams in there. Well, I had a holistic dentist deal with all of that. And within one year after getting all that fixed, my total cholesterol, Anthony, without changing anything else, dropped 100 points. So that tells you that that was really protecting me, that cholesterol is a good thing and protecting me. So I think we have to stop vilifying the cholesterol and start looking at what the real enemy in our health is, and that's the inflammation. And the inflammation markers are so easy to ask your doctor to run. If they don't run an HSCRP or a homocysteine or an IGF-1, there's so many different ways to measure for the presence of inflammation in the body. You've got to know where you stand there because guess what, guys? If you don't have inflammation, there is no disease happening in your body. And if you have no disease, why are you worried about your high cholesterol? Right. Any other markers besides kind of lipid profile that obviously you mentioned inflammation, which is, right. which is key. Like a, another reason, like I said, you need to test stuff for yourself and you need to yes. look, look at things as, as far as why they're happening in the first place. Um, anything else that you found is, is indicative of or something to look for? Absolutely. So things that you can uh, test at home, obviously you can take a blood blood pressure cuff and, and take your blood pressure at home to keep an eye on that. You can also test your blood sugar at home. And so there's glucometers galore out there that you can test for, um, you know, how you're doing in your blood sugar control. If you think, you know, you're able to tolerate 60 grams of carbohydrate and not be detrimental to your health, we'll test that bad boy and let's see how your blood sugar responds to those 60 grams of carbs. And you might find that's too many. You might find, hey, I'm doing just fine. So, But you don't know until you test. And of course, I'm a huge fan if you're trying to go ketogenic to go ahead and test for those blood ketones as well. There are some sophisticated breath tests as well. I'm just not a fan of urine uh, testing. I think it can be unreliable after the first couple of weeks of going keto. It's not to say they're totally bogus, but it just means you may not get reliable readings after once you become keto adapted. I think you really got to switch over to blood and or breath ketones. Um, as far as in the lab that you can ask your doctor to run, fasting insulin is never a bad thing. And if you've never had a five-hour GTT with insulin, uh, so it's five-hour glucose tolerance test, uh, and have them do insulin, what they do is they test uh, blood sugar and insulin at 30-minute intervals over two hours and then the last three hours uh, every hour on the hour. I've done that with a ketogenic meal uh, Anthony. And I actually, that's how I figured out that I had reactive hypoglycemia. Uh, cause I was having these, like I was spacing out like hours after eating a keto meal and I'm going, what in the world is going on? And it eventually worked itself out, but I didn't know what was going on until I saw on that five hour GTT that, uh, my blood sugar was getting down in like the fifties and sixties and, uh, yeah, wasn't good. And insulin was going up. So not good. But those are really good markers to, to keep an eye on. It's great advice. And so when you looked at that GTT, did you notice anything that obviously you had a reactive hyperglycemia 
but do you did you work through that? You said it worked itself out. Was there anything that you helped helped along? I was very new at that point to okay. to doing like sophisticated keto, like actively moderating protein, actively adding more fat, actively keeping total carbs down. Um, whereas before, it was just kind of low carb, and and I think making that switch from just a general low carb, which will help a lot of people. But sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes, especially for people with insulin resistance, uh, like myself and like most of the population, um, you've got to take it to that next level and get really, really serious with keto and making sure you have those ketones flowing through the body. And so that's when I found the benefits. And I think over time, the reactive hypoglycemia worked itself out because the body was like, okay, dummy, thanks for getting me out of limbo and choosing between being a sugar burner or a fat burner. Thank you for being a fat burner all the time now. So right. I've actually had that happen to me pretty recently. Um, I almost passed out at the gym. I was, I was kind of going in between. Um, I was going back into ketosis after yep. traveling. I was, I was eating plenty of carbs for a couple of weeks and I came back and I think it was the second day after being back. I'd been eating pretty, pretty high fat. Yeah. I mean, not entirely uh, ketogenic. And then I was doing a pretty intense kind of CrossFit style workout. And I, afterwards I, I remember feeling super lightheaded and, and like my heart started racing. My arms got tingling. I thought I was having a heart attack. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean the stuff uh, you need to take it slow and listen to your body for sure. That's right. Um, and so 2004, you got started. It's now 2017. What has changed in, in those 13 years? Obviously, information standpoint, but what have you seen change kind of in the, in the space in general? Yeah, I think we've shifted from low carb being the message, and it's just about keeping your carbs low because after a while, I think the mainstream was like, oh, yeah, we can buy into you know cutting down on your carbs. But what they haven't traditionally been in favor of is embracing dietary fat as the replacement for those carbs. Because when you lower the carbs, you got to replace those those calories with something. Well, you can only eat just so much protein. So what's that other something that's left? It's fat. And so for the longest time, we vilified fat, vilified fat, vilified fat. And now you got people like Dean Orner saying, oh, yeah, I think we should probably take some flax oil and we should do this. And uh, you were never for that before Dean Ornish. <laughs> He's a famous low fat vegan, by the way, guys. So uh, so I think the embracement of fat has been so gratifying to see. You've got to thank people like Gary Taubes and Nina Teicholz and different ones that have been out there trumpeting this cause, looking at all the history of this, that, you know, th this is the way we ate long, long time ago before that vilification of fat came in and, and strong in the 1980s that my mom bought into, like I talked about earlier, you know, we're finally seeing fat is back. And, and I think it's got the low fat people scared out of their mind because, <laughs> because they've, you know, pretty much predicated all of health at dietitians and traditionally trained, uh, you know, medical and, and nutritional health professionals, they're just freaking out about this keto thing because of the fat. And, and it's, it's wonderful in my eyes, Anthony, that we're seeing that fats aren't being vilified to the point that people are totally giving, giving them up. We're seeing in places like Costco, they got big end caps of coconut oil. Now they carry avocado oil. They have carry gold butter. So, I mean, we're getting the message out there and that's the major change that's happened since I started this in 2004. Is there anything that you've changed your mind on that, or that you've learned that you thought was kind of a hard, hard rule in the beginning that you've switched or softened on? Several things. Um, the net carbs thing. Uh, when I first started, I bought into net carbs because it sounded so great. Oh, you can subtract the fiber and subtract the sugar alcohols and they have zero effect on your blood sugar. Yeah, right. So I, I eventually had to come to a come to Jesus moment that said, hey, look, dummy. Um, it may not impact it as quickly, but it still impacts it. So you have to count those carbs in those things. So counting total carbs truly is the only way to be intellectually honest about what your tolerance level is. And so if you're counting the net carbs and you're getting 40 net carbs, but it's actually 70 grams of carbs and you're wondering, oh my gosh, why am I not seeing success? Well, guess what? You're counting uh, net carbs. You got to change it over to total carbs and then you know okay 40 grams boom that's my level uh or or in this case you know 15 20 grams probably my level so 
I think that was a big shift for me. Another shift, like I said, when I first started, I didn't really have a lot of guidance on what foods to eat. So I was eating grocery store food. And thanks to the paleo community in about 2010, I read Mark Sisson's book and, and befriended him, uh, The Primal Blueprint, and then Rob Wolf with The Paleo Solution and, and some of the other influencers in the paleo community really put real food on my radar screen because I had never thought about eating quality meats and organic vegetables and and fermented foods and that kind of thing was never a priority for me. But then I made it a priority and I found added benefits on top of the ketosis. Yes, the ketosis is cool, but when you nourish your body and you give it the nutrients it wants, you truly do feel the satiety that comes from that. And sometimes people are hungry they're like, oh, it just means I need more food. No, your body is telling you you're hungry because you haven't given it all the nutrients at once. And since I switched to real food, I, I like to tell people now, Anthony, that I eat primalio ketogenic. So I'm primal because <laughs> I still have a little bit of dairy and paleo because I eat real food and keto for the obvious reasons. So I think that's why I'm able to you know, go periods of time without eating. That intermittent fasting comes very easy for me, even extended fasting, very easy for me now. Um, and, and the real food, I think, is the reason why. So I want to bring it back to one of the things you said when you were determining that total carbs versus net carbs situation. Yep. yep. One of the biggest things that you said that I want to hit on is that you said you could figure out what your tolerance level is. That's right. Right. Not a blanket statement of, oh, everyone has to eat under 50 grams of carbs. Um. What do you think is the best way to test con tolerance levels on an individual basis? Is it ketone levels? Is it blood glucose? Blood sugar. Is it is it a combination yeah. of both? And how yeah, would you I, recommend somebody to do that? I think blood sugar is the telltale sign. So let's say you think you can get away with a, a meal that has 35 grams of carbohydrate, total carbohydrate in it. Okay, knock yourself out. Test your blood sugar before Test it at 30, 60, 90, and 120. Uh, and if at 60 minutes after it's over 140 milligrams per deciliter, eh, you probably shouldn't have had that. <laughs> or within two hours, it's not back to baseline. Eh, yeah, you probably didn't need to do that. And so I, I, I think blood sugar is the easiest way. You're going to waste ketone strips if you try to test ketones to do that. So I think the most economical to give you actual results would be the blood sugar. Okay. And then another thing that I wanted to point out is that it, it's not just grams of carbohydrates either. Like you said, the different types can matter as well. So yes. sugar alcohols or fibers can just delay this process. Um, That's right. Or bananas versus cookies. There's that, there's that study that I'm sure you've heard of where they've affected people's blood sugar differently. So it's a very individual process uh, for a lot, right. of different, a lot of different reasons. So testing yourself is always the, the best way to go here. And here's another thing, just because Johnny Joe, the famous blogger online talking about keto can have X food, doesn't mean that you can have that same X food. You have to realize that you're a different person than Johnny Joe. And you've got to figure out what are those foods that work best for me. And just because other people online are talking about some X food that, oh, my gosh, everybody and their mom in the keto community is eating this doesn't mean you can eat it. So you've got to tinker and test and find what works for you. Good point. Um, so you said then you started switching to whole food diet recently or you know, 2010 or so. 2011, is, yep. Okay. What does your kind of day-to-day -day nutrition look like now as far as breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, whatever? So, yeah, the traditional breakfast snack, lunch snack, dinner snack, midnight snack is how normal Americans eat. I say normal. I don't think eating that way is normal anymore. But, no, I find that I only eat maybe once or twice a day. And that freaks people out. They're like, oh, my gosh, I'd be so hungry. Uh, uh You know, think about this. People are like, OK, fasting. That That's the other F word, as I like to call it. Uh, you know, and people, I could never fast. I'm like, you, you don't think you could fast for 18 hours? 18 hours. Oh, my gosh. So six o'clock at night is your last meal of the day. Okay. You wake up the next morning, you're not really hungry, but culture tells you you're supposed to eat, quote, breakfast. It's the most important meal of the day. But what they didn't tell you is that breakfast, all that word mean is, means is breaking the fast. And so if you want to have your break fast at noon the next day, guess what? Six o'clock the night before to noon the next day is an 18-hour fast, and your body has such benefits from that. 
And I probably do somewhere between a 16 to 18 hour fast just about every single day. It's pretty easy for me to fast because I'm so satiated. If I get a little tinge of hunger during that time, I'll have some exogenous ketones or something like that that will fill uh, fill there without adding in a lot of calories. And so uh, it's one way to do that. And then if, as far as the meals themselves, you can have, you know, don't make it hard. I think I think people try to overcomplicate this and have fancy schmancy recipes at every single meal. Guess what, guys? Meat, vegetables, fat. That's the basis of yep. every meal that you should have. Meat, vegetables, and fat. And if it's a breakfast thing, you could add in eggs as well. But it, it's so stupid easy. You know, it, it amazes me how people try to complicate something that is so simple. Get you a hamburger patty, add in some broccoli cooked in butter. You know, if you want to put a little cheese on top, uh, cheddar cheese on top of the, the hamburger, you want to add some avocado mayo or or an avocado with that or some mustard. And that's a nice little meal. I mean, I, I think we make it too hard, Anthony, where people think, oh, my gosh, there's no way I could eat that way. I'm like, that's delicious food. And then, oh, yeah, by the way, when you eat that food, you're not thinking about food at all for the next six, eight, ten hours. And so it, it's a beautiful, freeing thing. I mean, I come from a binge eating background and I can go days without eating and not even think about it. It's funny you mention that because last night at about 5 p.m. I had a, a giant... Um, salad with avocado and olive oil and uh, avocado oil and lamb on it. Yep. And I, it's one o'clock and I have not eaten since then. I haven't thought about food since then. So there you go. And see, that's pretty, an amazing thing. Huh? Because <laughs> it's so freeing. People don't realize because all they think about is within the context of being a sugar burner of not eating. Like I, I had some blood work done for life insurance this morning and the lady came at 6 a.m. and she said, are you fasting? Yes, ma'am. When's the last time you ate? Six o'clock last night. And remember, it was 6 a.m. said, oh, my gosh, you must be starving. I said, no, ma'am, I probably won't eat till about one o'clock today. What? Why are you starving yourself? <laughs> she couldn't put her head around that I was fat adapted and I was perfectly fine. Yeah, every time I... So I've been traveling a lot last five months or so for work and a lot of international flights, you know, 10, 15-hour flights. Oh, those are brutal. And... Uh, yeah, yeah, they're they're not that bad. I get a lot of work done, but every time they come through with with meals, I'm just like, no, nah, I'm good. And then thirty minutes later, no, nah, I'm okay. And then an hour later, yeah. no, nah, I'm good. And they're just like, oh, you are, are you You're never okay? eating? Are you, are you, <laughs> is something wrong? Are you gonna pass out? Like, no, I'm just yeah. I have like a one pack of exogenous ketones the whole time, and, and that's the only thing I'm dealing with. So. Yeah, you, sh- you should show them that. You should say, "Hey, look, this is my elixir." <laughs> yeah, I mean, it works. It works. Uh, there you go. It works really well. So, yeah, I mean, another thing too is that everyone's looking for meal plans um, from Perfect Keto, and one of the things that again we we sort of harp on is that, like you said, have a simple template and then eat whatever you like until yes. whenever you're hungry, uh, when you're hungry, and when you're not. That's right. And it's 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 pretty easy after that point. Um, complicating it with recipes and meal plans can, can make it very hard, I think, to maintain it. I know some people will obviously prefer that structure, but for the, for the majority of people, I think, you know, make some salads, make some vegetables, coat it in fat, and have a little bit of protein on the side. It's you know what I think it is? I think I think it's a sign of our culture that we've, you know, so, so been saturated with the Food Network and in the mainstream of all, you know, Rachel Ray writing all these cookbooks that people kind of come to expect that, oh, well, I eat keto now, so I should have all these really nice cookbooks, and, and they're great. A lot of my friends are writing those kind of books, and I've written a few of those kind of books. But I think at the end of the day, if you don't complicate it and you keep it simple, you'll stick to it a lot longer. Great. That's a good tip. So I like to think about nutrition as one of the four kind of pillars in health with uh, movement, stress, and sleep. Um, So obviously, we covered your nutrition. What are you doing for movement now? You said you've modified that over the last couple of years. What is it? What's it look like on a day-to-day basis now? I started with the treadmill thing at three miles an hour and then graduated to elliptical and then did spin class and all this kind of stuff. Uh, These days, I'm more of a hit guy uh, if I'm going to do something, you know, because my time is so short doing five podcasts a week and writing new books coming out the ears. So I don't have a lot of time for that kind of thing. So there's two stop signs along the side road over here where I live. And so and going uphill, uh, 
with the all out. I go all out uphill to that next stop sign and then I'll walk back downhill to the stop sign, do it again about six, eight times. And that's a great workout. No matter where you are in your fitness level, anybody can go all out for 30 seconds at a time. Um, and so, so I do that. Uh, I also have a huge tractor tire in my backyard. I should probably do like a Periscope or Facebook Live or something of me flipping that tire. But man, what a workout. You talk about resistance training. <laughs> Those things are heavy, especially when like water starts to build up in it. We just had a snow and so snow builds up in it and uh, flip that bad boy over about 8, 10, 12 times and I'm huffing and puffing. So it's it's a great workout. And so that's what I do for primarily for exercise. Yeah, it's a good point that intensity is relative when working out. And so, like you said, anybody can go out and, and push it to you know, 80, 90% of, of their maximum intensity. And that's going to be that's a good right. workout for that person. It's not like that's you right. have to compare yourself to somebody who's been training forever. You're not Michael Phelps. Don't try to be like Michael Phelps and do his, <laughs> his kind of training schedule. Yeah, it's just it's insane. Um, what about sleep? What is your sleep situation looking like? Sleep is the one area where I'm kind of off and on. Um, and, and I'm trying everything known to mankind. I mean, I've been doing all the usual things for years, the blackout curtains, the taking, uh, you know, melatonin and magnesium about an hour before bed, you know, doing some of those things to putting on the essential oils that, that help you sleep. Um, and then I recently invested in like a really, really nice bed, uh, to try to help with the sleep. Um, but a lot of it has to do, too, with your circadian rhythms and making sure you get enough sunlight early in the day. And I and I make that a priority. So some nights I'll get that beautiful sleep where I wake up the next day and I feel so refreshed. I actually have this ring that I wear that tracks the sleep for me. Is it um, ring? I hate to Yes, they were. Yeah, I was trying not to give them a free plug. But <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Um, and so they. um they have a, I mean, it's really great technology. And so you can see when you're in deep sleep, light sleep, REM sleep, and, and of course awake. And so, um, so I'm able to track it and actually see that some nights I do really well. I still have some off nights. Uh, some of that is stress induced. Um, and I know that's what you're going to ask about next. How do you deal with stress? Um, and so I, if I can get the stress consistently down, then I could probably sleep well. And of course, sleep, impacts weight, impacts blood sugar, impacts ketone levels, all of those things. It's all related, guys. It's all it's all on the same spectrum. Yeah, so might as well move to the next one. Stress. Bring the stress on, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I think sometimes those of us in the health community, we're so passionate about trying to get out the word about health that we actually compromise a little bit of our health in the process. And I mean, I do five podcasts a week. I'm on other people's shows like yours. Uh, so you stress me out today. I'm just kidding. This is a lot of fun. Um, I write books, you know, and doing all the kind of day-to-day -day stuff that I've been able and very privileged to be able to do for many years. Uh, you know, and I've, I've often joked that maybe I should take a whole year off and just kind of rest the body and relax and rejuvenate. I mean, I'm still just as passionate about it today. But some days I go, you know, I wonder if taking a year off would, you know, help take some of that stress off and it would be a good thing. So I'm, I'm thinking of that not anytime soon, but it would be nice to, to see what impact kind of letting go for a year would be like. Jimmy, you can't go for a year, man. <laughs> like I said, we'll, it's kind we'll of this love much. hate relationship of, you know, if I go away, will people care? And then if I, if I, you know, if I come back, will they come back with, you know, so I, I don't know, maybe there's a happy medium of, you know, taking a, a couple months off, you know, at the end of a year or something at some point. But yeah, that's, that's my, that's my double edged sword right now is I want to keep getting the word out. But I also got to take care of me because I've had some weight gain because of the stress. I've had some, you know, insulin start to creep up a little bit. It's like around 11, 12, and I'm trying to get it under five. And so those things, they rear their ugly head in the pursuit of trying to help other people get healthy. I've, I've compromised a little bit of my own health. Is there anything that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis where you help kind of decrease that overall stress load? Yeah. I mean, I love yoga. So, I mean, I could, I could definitely do that. I love deep breathing exercises. Um, but I'm certainly open on this one. One of these days I'm going to write a book called stress clarity when I figure it out. <laughs> I'm always waiting for that one. So, I mean, that's the biggest problem that I struggle with as well. Like you said, when, yes. when you're so intense as, as far as tr trying to get this stuff, 
getting some feel behind it and, and getting some change happening, it's, you know, we can, we can compromise our own health, which is a little sad, well, but when you hustle and when you're an entrepreneur and when you're trying to kind of make a difference in the world, it's almost impossible for that not to have a physiological effect on your body. Yeah. So you said you're writing all this stuff. Are you coming out with anything new that we should be looking out for soon with what's going on with, with kind of what your schedule and plan is for 2018? Yeah. So I actually have, speaking of stress, three books coming out <laughs> I don't this know how you year. Do that with a couple of other ideas for 2019. So yeah, so uh, Keto Cure is coming out. This is the long awaited book that I'm writing with uh, Doc Muscles, Dr. Adam Nally, uh, my former Keto Talk co-host. And so that one is coming out. It's gonna be kind of a sequel to my book, Keto Clarity, that's a little more, um, I guess, in depth. If you understand ketosis and you want to kind of see the metabolic pathway, how ketosis helps with various disease states, we're going to get into the ins and outs of all that in that book. So that's in February when that comes out. Then in April, Keto Freedom, I'm co-authoring with Meg Dahl. Uh, She's a registered holistic nutritionist. Uh, She had anorexia that she was able to overcome by eating more fat. So her coming from the anorexia into things, me coming from the binge eating into things. Uh, so we're going to talk about a lot of mindset stuff um, and and self love. You know, a lot of the messages that really is you know people don't really want to talk about those things. Well, we're going to talk about it and be very blunt about it. Um, and then later this year, my wife Christine, who just became a nutritional therapy practitioner, she and I are writing a book called Real Food Keto that's going to incorporate a lot of the keto principles. Through the, uh, through the context of the Nutritional Therapy Association teachings. And so uh, it's one thing to get those teachings, but what does it mean for the ketogenic dieter? And so we're going to kind of outline that in a book. So busy, busy, busy. Busy man. We'll be on lookout. So until then, where can people find you? Yeah, I'm easy to find. Just Google my name, Jimmy Moore, uh, or you can look up livinlavidalowcarb.com. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jimmy. Thank you, bud. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Keto Answers Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. But even if you didn't, I would love a review. Just go over to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast, and pop in a review so we can get found by more people, get better guests, and have the information that you need. So please go to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast, and leave us a review. And if you're new to keto, head on over to perfectketo.com slash podcast and enter your email for all our top tips and guides on getting started with the ketogenic diet. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.